And then when you say that you have all the privileges to air your mentally disturbed views as long as you talk about yourself and your followers. So apparently it is you, our beloved uncle, who is using this kind of language. You are accusing us of having mentally disturbed views, which we are not the least bit troubled or phased by. You are entitled to your opinion. And in fact, in the past, we have also said that this kind of reaction to al-Islah is to be expected because every da'wah of haqq, if you study the Quran, every prophet that went to their went to his community, every single messenger Allah says, who was sent to his community in Surah Zariyat, Allah says he was either called a sha'ir, a poet, or majnoon, or someone who is mentally disturbed. When you speak haqq and you share the teachings of prophets of haqq, you will be called mentally disturbed. This is to be expected. So we are not the least bit hurt or offended or troubled by this. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. We begin in the name of Allah, the most beneficent, the most merciful. We have received a letter from uh, Al-Hajj Rasul by Shamji, uh, which he has sent in personal capacity, dated 6th Muharram 1446, 13th of July 2024. And he has addressed me with this letter. Uh, he has titled it, Holier Than Thou. And uh, it's by way of commentary on the previous lecture that was released by Al-Islah. He says, Dear Hur Kamunpuri, Salam, Peace. Uh, my response is, Wa alaykum as -salam, wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Then he writes, You have all the privileges to air your mentally disturbed views as long as you talk about yourself and your followers but it doesn't give you any right to condemn the Shia Ithna Asharis with such absurd accusations. Who are you to decide for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And the answer is, I am nobody to decide for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I have never decided or in passed any judgment on behalf of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Aslan, I have not condemned the Shia Ithna Ashari community at all. What I have presented with you or what I have presented in that lecture are actually... Uh, verses of the Quran, statements of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt والسلام, and advisories of our own uh, top maraji and scholars in which they have warned against relying on weak evidence, relying on dreams and visions and superstition. So I am not condemning anybody. I was simply discussing a mindset that unfortunately is becoming prevalent and it is being reinforced by the member. The mindset whereby people think, and this phrase and expression that I had used in that lecture is something that I didn't invent from my pocket. This is an, actually a slogan uh, that I picked up from our Hoja brothers in Dar es Salaam. I heard it with my own ears. I didn't make it up from my own pocket. And if you have lived in Dar es Salaam, you should be familiar with this slogan or this statement that Hojas themselves, they use it when they are in self-critical mode. And also sometimes they may use it in a lighter way when they complain about this mindset. And the statement is in Kiswahili, Kullu Shia Jannati Ba'da Kula Pilaw. That there is this mindset which says, which tries to argue that Jannah and salvation is something that can be achieved very easily. All you need to do is take part in some rituals, you know, cry for Imam Hussein a little bit, eat your niyaz, do the matam, and inshallah, salvation is guaranteed. So we took this mindset and we discussed it in light of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has actually said in the Quran. What uh, the Imams of Ahlul Bayt السلام, have said in the narrations which have been authenticated by Sayyidi Sistani because we were presenting the advisories of Sayyidi Sistani in which he is warning the people of Mimbar and telling them don't promote these kinds of superstitious claims which have no backing and evidence in the Quran and the Sunnah and the actual Hadith and teaching of the Ahlul Bayt السلام, and the only evidence you have for these tall claims and these exaggerations is dreams which are currently what are being used on your member in Dar es Salaam to promote and justify and support these ideas. So we were complaining and uh, critiquing a mindset that exists in some seg segments of our community. And we were 
talking about how sometimes the member can play a role in reinforcing that mindset. We were not condemning anyone and we have no interest in condemning anyone. Why? Because we want Islah of our community. Islah of our community will not come from condemning our community. If we can condemn our community, that is only going to generate a negative uh, reactions. So we have no interest in generating negative reactions. We want islah of the community. We want reform and course correction to be introduced in the community. And that is why we have never ever condemned any sect or the followers of any sect. The most that we do is we condemn evil practices which go against the teaching of the Quran, against the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam, against the ahadith and authentic Quran verified teachings of the Imams of the Ahlul Bayt wasallam. So first of all, this claim of yours is completely incorrect that we have tried to condemn the Shia Ithna Ashari. In fact, this is proof that you have not even watched the lecture because Wallahi, if you had seen the lecture, you cannot show me a single statement from there where we are condemning the 12 hour imami community. Rather, we are trying to highlight the problem in the mindset and we are trying to correct it in light of the guidance of the Quran the teachings of the Ahlul Bayt Ali Musalam and the advisories and directives of the supreme religious authority that you people claim to subscribe to, which is al marjaiyya al Al-Uzma, the supreme merja of our time, who is Ayatollah Sayyid Ali Al-Husseini Sistani. We presented their, his advisory, his directive. And then when you say that you have all the privileges to air your mentally disturbed views, as long as you talk about yourself and your followers, so apparently it is you, our beloved uncle, who is using this kind of language. You are accusing us of having mentally disturbed views, which we are not the least bit troubled or fazed by. You are entitled to your opinion. And in fact, in the past, we have also said that this kind of reaction to al-Islah is to be expected because every da'wah of haqq, if you study the Quran, every prophet that went to, their, went to his community, Every single messenger Allah says, who was sent to his community in Surah Zariyat, Allah says he was either called a sha'ir, a poet, or majnoon, or someone who is mentally disturbed. When you speak haq and you share the teachings of prophets of haq, you will be called mentally disturbed. This is to be expected. So we are not the least bit hurt or offended or troubled by this. And not just the Quran and the prophets, even secular Non-Muslim philosophers, for example, have said that all truth passes through three stages. Every truth, before it gets accepted by a community, it has to pass through three stages. And this is a very truthful statement. You will see it holds true for Islam as well. And we are seeing that it holds true for Islah as well. Any kind of Islah in the Ummah is going to face these three stages and phases. He says every truth has to pass through three stages. First, it is ridiculed. Stage number one, it is ridiculed. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he started preaching the message in Mecca, they called him kahin, a soothsayer. They called him sha'ir, a poet. They called him majnoon, which is mentally disturbed, insane, mad person. Even though he was akmalul uqala, he was the one with the most perfect intellect. Yet they called him a majnoon. They called him mentally disturbed. And similarly, the previous prophets of God were also called majnoon by the disbelievers and by the people who wanted to ridicule them. So yes, this part of the statement we can even verify against the Quran, even though a non-Muslim philosopher said this, but this statement is true that all truth has to pass through three stages. The first stage is that it is ridiculed. And even in the case of Al-Islah, we are seeing this that our dearest beloved uncle Al-Hajj Rasul Bhai is using ridicule against us. He's saying that your views are mentally disturbed, which is fine. This is ridicule. After ridicule, the philosopher says the second stage that comes is that the truth is violently opposed. You can see in Mecca how the followers of the Prophet wasallam, the early Muslims were tortured and persecuted. Ammar bin Yasir, his father and mother were actually martyred Bilal ibn Rabah, Ridwanullah ta'ala alayhi, look at how he was tortured in the scorching sun. Huge stones were placed on his chest. 
So this is all the violence that was unleashed by the kuffar and mushrikeen of Mecca against Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And even today, if you follow the path of the Prophet, you try to speak the truth about the Quran and the Sunnah, you will have to see these kinds of scenarios. In the case of Al-Islah, we have seen Urban Rose incident, the infamous Urban Rose incident, which the Al-Islah admins also have videos and they have video evidence of it. And unfortunately, we cannot forget the role that was plays that was played by the likes of our beloved uncle Al Hajj Rasul Bhai Shamji in instigating and mobilizing people. Uh, because before that event, he was writing similar posts like this, trying to fuel fire and hatred against the movement of Al Islah which I simply do not understand. How can you hate even the word Islah for anyone who loves Aba Abdullah al Hussein? Do you not know that Imam al Hussein salam, set out from the city of his beloved grandfather for what? For Islah in the Ummah of his grandfather. And he said, I want to do Amr bil Ma'roof and Nahi al Munkar. What else is Al Islah doing? You think we are presenting opinions from our pockets? Show us, challenge to show us one opinion that we have presented from our pocket, which is not found in the Quran, and the Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, and which is not backed by the authentic Quran verified teachings of the Ahlul Bayt You show us one such opinion, we promise you we will take it back and publicly apologize for it. But you can't. It is our challenge that you cannot show us anything that we have presented by way of Islah to our community, which we have not provided the evidence for from the clear verses of the Quran from the Quran verified statements of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Imams of Ahlul Bayt Alaihi who used to preach the message of the Quran and expound it for the people. And on top of that, we have also backed our positions by the best research that is coming out from the Hawzat of Najaf and Qum itself. So it's not like we are quoting Wahhabi. You cannot show us one episode, one lecture where we are quoting some Wahhabi or Salafi scholar like Ibn Taymiyyah or Ibn Abdul Wahhab or some other deviant sect. We are quoting to you Quran. We are quoting to you the Imams of Ahlul Bayt and your own scholarship. In our lectures, you will see us quoting to you the research of Sayyidi Sistani. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserve him and prolong his life. We will, you will see us quoting to you research of Ayatollah Sayyid Abul Qasim al khui Ayatollah Sayyidi Shaheed Muhammad Baqir al-Sadr. Why do you have a problem with these scholars? Now you say, well, but what you are presenting, how come our resident Alim and Zakirin, they don't present? Well, we have answered that question because if they start presenting it to you, you will start treating them the way you are treating us. You will start writing letters to them saying, keep your mentally disturbed views to yourself. So they don't want to be in this position whereby they, they have to face so much ridicule and so much hatred and so much, you know, mobilization. They, bichara, they want to live in the community in peace. They don't want to walk on the path of thorns. So this is why they don't want to do this. And I also, please watch my lecture entitled, Why are the Maraja silent? Because on many of the issues, yes, even though the Maraja condemn many of the popular practices that we have been speaking out against, but they don't do it very aggressively and they don't do it very on a massive scale. They write about it in their advanced level books, which no one reads on the ground. So we take those books and we present to you the statements that they are admitting in their highest level, Bahthul Kharij discussions, in their Hausa lectures. We are bringing you that evidence only. So if you are, are going to call us mentally disturbed, you are simply accusing your own scholarship because we are presenting you their views only. And we are presenting to you above that, we are presenting to you Quran, we are presenting to you teachings of Ahlul Bayt. None of these are mentally disturbed, Bihamdillah. So what we would like to say to you is that, yes, you are entitled to your opinion 
and we are we we forgive you and we are not going to hold against you that you have tried to ridicule us it is true that when new research is presented when our cherished inherited beliefs and practices and rituals are called into question it is a tough experience we ourselves went through this just like you are having problem we also had the same problem when the first time we read the quran and pondered over the verses that we had previously ignored and we started to realize that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has clearly condemned things that we are doing in our communities and that we ourselves were involved in when we read the ahadith and warnings of the ahlul bayt against these popular practices and beliefs then we also initially we had some uh, it was very difficult for us we had sleepless nights but then eventually we decided that look on the day of judgment no one is going to come to save us وَمَا لَكُمْ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ مِن وَلِيٍّ وَلَا نَصِيرٍ Allah says you shall not have anyone other than Allah as a guardian and protector. So we decided to submit to the guidance of Allah and His Messenger and the Imams of Ahlul Bayt from His progeny. And that is why you see us preaching what we are preaching. Now you say why are the maraja not so actively? Yani they write it in their books, but why don't they come out and speak? Well, we have even shared with you clips in past Al-Islah lectures where they have spoken. But why is this not being spread more? Well, the answer to that is given in the lecture, why are the maraja silent? We have also attempted to explain in the words of the marja'iyah itself, why they say that we are not able to reform and campaign against every falsehood and against every batil that we know of in our community. And they have mentioned the reason. Inshallah, go watch that lecture. You will get... We have presented the words of Ayatollah Sayyidi Shaheed Muhammad Baqir al-Sadr. He explains why you don't see the marja'iyah as active as you would like it to be in spreading reform within the community. Then I come to your next statement. You write, just to remind you, if you have forgotten, that our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he was to introduce his prophethood, he had first invited his family and blood relationship to declare to them. Before he declared, he served them with blessed meal and then he propagated. What do you have to comment on that? What I have to comment on that is that this is haq. This incident that you have shared, Allah refers to it in the Quran. Allah ordered him to issue the warning to his closest relatives. And so the Prophet ﷺ invited them and he gave them food to eat. And this this proves that you did not watch the lecture. This is the sad part. We say you are 100% you have the freedom to criticize us, even to condemn us, to ridicule us, do whatever you want to do. But at least engage with the content first so that you don't end up refuting straw mans and non-existent claims. When did we say that feeding people is wrong? When did we say that? You say you're... If you say we saw something on your thumbnail, Baba, the thumbnail is not the lecture. The lecture is actual, actually the content. The thumbnail is simply to introduce you to what is discussed in the lecture. Do you understand? So you are clearly not watching the lecture. What, is, what, did, what were we discussing in the lecture? Were we saying in the lecture that it is against the sunnah of the Prophet to feed people? Show me. Show me that statement. I will apologize right now or whenever you show it to me. When have, when have I ever said that feeding people and giving people food to eat is wrong or against Islam or against the Sunnah? On the contrary, this is one of the most beautiful Sunan and practices of Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. So when you ask me, what do you have to comment on that? My comment on that is that this is haq. I agree with you. But you haven't watched the lecture. This is, this is why you are under the misconception and illusion that I am trying to condemn something when I have not condemned it. And you are thinking I have condemned it because maybe you are listening to propaganda. Maybe you are listening to hearsay instead of watching the lecture yourself. And then you mention that therefore, when we serve niyaz, be it pulao, biryani, kichro, or dal and rice at our imam bargas and our centers, we follow the sunnah of our beloved prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his ahlul bayt. And I fully agree with you. What makes you think that I think otherwise? Who told you that I have said anything other than this? And I, I will give you further proof of this. You did not mention, you mentioned Da'wad al-Ashira. I can give you even proof from the Quran for this. In Surah Al-Insan, Surah Al-Dahar. Don't you read those verses which were revealed 
according to the mufassirin in the sha'n of ahlul bayt alayhi salam don't you read that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says wa yut'imuna at-ta'ama ala hubbihi miskinan wa yatiman wa asira that these blessed personalities these noble personalities yut'imuna at-ta'am they feed food ala hubbihi over the love for it yet miskinan wa yatiman wa asira they feed it to the miskin to the poor and indigent and needy people wa yatim to the orphan and to the asir to the captive the prisoner and in those days most of the prisoners and the captives used to be non muslims and so this means that the ahlul bayt alayhi salam when they used to feed their food when they used to give food they would not discriminate on grounds of race or ethnicity or religion or sect and this is how we should be this is how i hope our communities are also that they when you, when you when you feed people you keep the doors open i recall my respected father in his time in dar es salam he had recited a majlis in the main imam bargah where he had said that after the majlis i see the niyaz and mashallah so many people come and they eat but i do not see any africans i do not see any people of bilal why is this the case why are the people of color not allowed into the programs or why are they not invited to these programs because when it comes to feeding yes you should feed everyone but the quran focuses on miskinan wa yatiman wa asira if you if we are true followers of ahlul bayt we should give priority and precedence to feeding these groups the poor the needy the orphans the widows and the disenfranchised marginalized underprivileged sections of society so in our time in dar es salam there was some problem in this area my father tried to reform it from the member the jamaat was not happy but my father said that look if we claim to be the shia of ahlul bayt and the followers of ahlul bayt then hamara dastarkhan jo hai unke dastarkhan ki tarah hona chahiye our table spread should be like their table spread we should invite everyone to it and they should be the door should be kept open i am not saying that the doors are not open right now this is something you people know best if they are open may allah subhanahu wa taala bless you and may allah accept uh, all the food that you are feeding to all the people, people especially the poor and the needy for the sake of allah subhanahu wa taala the only thing that we would say you need to reform and get right as far as this is concerned is that you should feed the way the ahlul bayt used to feed look at what allah says in the next verse innama نُطْعِمُكُمْ لِوَجْهِ اللَّهِ لَا نُرِيدُ مِنْكُمْ جَزَاءً وَلَا شُكُورًا The way of the Ahlul Bayt is after feeding the people, they used to say to them, we feed you only for the sake of Allah. The Ahlul Bayt do not say we feed you for the sake of Allah and, you know, this is niyaz of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or this is niyaz of Imam Hassan and Imam Hussain and Mawla Abbas. And, no, 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 no. إِنَّمَا نُطْعِمُكُمْ لِوَجْهِ اللَّهِ Ahlul Bayt were Allah focused Allah centric people every good deed that you do you do it for the sake of Allah Ahlul Bayt automatically inshallah on the day of judgment when they find out about it that you are following their seerah and sunnah they will be happy with you but don't make their happiness the focus the Ahlul Bayt their focus was always on the happiness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so when you feed you say we are doing this only and only for Allah the Ahlul Bayt we are following their noble role model and their noble example So Ahlul Bayt we follow but our devotion is only for Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala this is the way of the Ahlul Bayt and if you are already doing this well and good if you are not this is just some hum humble uh, suggestion and advice from our side so then when you say that therefore when we serve niyaz be it pulao biryani kichro or dal and rice at our imam bargahs and our centers we follow the sunnah of our beloved prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wasallam and his Ahlul Bayt alayhi wasallam and i fully agree with you and if you think that i disagree with this then that can only prove one thing you did not even bother to watch the full lecture before you sent us this commentary but still we welcome it even though you did not engage with the content we are still responding to it theek okay? hai then you said you and your cult so again referring to al islah which is a movement that is open to all it is open to uh, shias have joined it sunnis have joined it salafis have joined it and they are saying that alhamdulillah you are showing us a side of the ahlul bayt that is so non sectarian that is so quran based we did not know this ahlul bayt existed 
Because we thought that the followers of Ahlul Bayt are people of innovation and bid'ah and they don't care about the deen. But now the religion of the Ahlul Bayt that you are presenting from the authentic sources, this is beautiful religion. This is such deep insight into the deen. So, but khair, as we said, that uh, as that uh, philosopher said, all truth passes through three stages. The first is ridicule. And alhamdulillah, we are seeing the ridicule. This convinces us that alhamdulillah, at least one sign of being on the truth and being on the path of the prophets, we have checked it. Yani one symptom of being on haq is that you are ridiculed. At least that one symptom, we are displaying and exhibiting that, that symptom. The fact that we are facing ridicule and uh, derision, uh, this is a sign that we are on the path of Rasulullah. My fathers, my respected father used to say to me, because I have a majlis reciting career of over 20 years. I've been reciting majalis in different centers, hoja and non-hoja around the world. Every time I used to recite majlis and I used to get down from the mimbar, people literally used to come and kiss my hands. And they used to hug me. And they used to shower so much love on me. And they used to say, MashaAllah, SubhanAllah, Mawla, Salamat Rakke, your majlis was so amazing. You've changed our life. You've done this, you've done that. And when I used to go back, my father used to say that he used to interview me and interrogate me. He used to say that, did you see what the people were saying? I say, yes, they were praising me. He said, yes, tell me something. Are you more eloquent than Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Are you a better public speaker than the Sayyidul Fusaha and Sayyidul Bulagha? The master of all the eloquent people? Are you more eloquent than Amirul Mu'mineen Ali bin Abi Talib alayhi salam? Are you more eloquent than Imam Hussein alayhi salam? Na'udhu billah? And I would say, oh, absolutely not. And he would say, then, well, explain to me one thing. How come when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to preach the true message of Islam, people used to pelt him with stones. They used to throw stones at him. They used to put thorns on his path. But mashallah, when you recite majlis, people shower you with roses, metaphorically speaking, and they praise you and they love what you recite. Why is that the case? Are you more eloquent than Rasulullah? I would say no. He would say the reason is that we the Zakirin, we are still, even today, we are not presenting the full haqq. We are not presenting the full truth of the Quran and the Ahlul Bayt alayhi musalam. If we start presenting the tough and bitter pill that's found in our own sources. If we start, if we stop promoting popular concepts and in fact share the actual guidance of the Quran and the Ahlul Bayt and share it in full depth. Right now also we are sharing Quran and Ahlul Bayt, but we are not giving the full picture, unfortunately. If you start giving the full picture and the full evidence of the Quran and Ahlul Bayt and you start showing people where they have gone wrong, where they have deviated from the way of the Ahlul Bayt. If you start doing this, even today you will be pelted with stones. Or if they can't pelt you with stones, then at least with verbal arrows and spears, they will strike you and they will attack you. And Alhamdulillah, my respected father was so true. He spoke the truth. I, I can see the truth because Al-Islah, when we got the platform of Al-Islah and we started promoting, promoting what's actually in the Quran and giving the full picture and especially sharing the warnings of the Quran and the Imams of Ahlul Bayt against ghulu, against extremism and exaggeration and deviation, which they have condemned. When we started sharing that, the praises and the subhanallah and the wah wah and mashallah, all of that got converted into into this, what we are reading today, your mentally disturbed views. Alhamdulillah. This means we are on the path of the Prophet. Because the Prophet, our grandfather, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was also called Majnoon. In the Quran, it is written that he was called Majnoon. He was called mentally disturbed. Why? Because he preached Tawheed in a community that was glued to shirk, that was obsessed with shirk. And unfortunately, that reality has come back full, full circle. Today, if you stand up for Tawheed, if you preach and promote the Tawheed of the Ahlul Bayt, you tell our beloved people that Baba, the Imams of Ahlul Bayt never ever taught you to do dua to them. We have so many lectures in which we have shared the actual sayings of Imam alayhi salatu wasalam, where they have said, dua al-ibadah, dua is ibadah, it's worship. 
you are not supposed to ask your hajat from anyone other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it is the way of the Ahlul Bayt, Imam Ali alayhi salam in his letter to Al-Hasan alayhi salam, he says, وَلَمْ يَجْعَلْ بَيْنَكَ وَبَيْنَهُ مَنْ يَشْفَعُ لَكَ Allah has not appointed any intercessor between you and him who is supposed to serve as an intermediary to take your du'as to Allah. Rather, you, whenever you want, you can open the doors of his treasure by directly calling upon him. When we present this Tawheed of the Ahlul Bayt, all of a sudden, the Subhanallah and the Wah Wah and the MashaAllah, Mawla Salamat Rakhi and all of that, khatam, it is finished. And now, it is you have all the privileges to air your mentally disturbed views as long as you talk about yourself. So yes, this is the price that you have to pay for preaching Tawheed and the real teaching of Ahlul Bayt in our communities today. And Alhamdulillah, we are happy. We signed up for this. I am not. That is why I forgive our dearest beloved uncle. I know he means well, but it's just that he has grown up in a community where all these things have become so popular and so common that when we present the actual teaching of the Quran, it seems like it's crazy. You know, just like how the Zakirin used to mention that when Imam al-Mahdi will come, people will say he has brought a new religion. We'll say, how? The religion of Islam is here. You know, we are all praying and fasting. How? And then the same Zakirin used to explain that, Baba, the deen up, up to that time will have become so badly distorted that when he will bring the real deen, it will seem to you like it's some crazy, extreme, or some, some nonsensical deen and not the real deen. This is how far you will have deviated from the deen by the time he comes. So in any case, coming back to the statement, you and your cult, as much as you try to brainwash the innocent believers, you will not be able to accept a few whose mindset are like of yourself. So look, we are not interested in brainwashing anyone. We are simply presenting to you food for thought. Okay? Food for thought. Listen to what we are saying. We are not saying anything from our pocket. For everything, every claim that we make, we back it up from the Quran. We back it up from the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the hadith of the imams of Ahlul Bayt alayhim of salatu wa sallam. And interestingly, because you people are value scholarship so much, we also bring to you the best research from the Hawzat of Najaf and Qum and Syria and Lebanon. And we present to you what your own scholars have admitted in their advanced level writings, which unfortunately are not presented to you from the mimbar. Why? Because your own resident alims and your own shuyukh either maybe have not read those writings because they're advanced level or they have read them, but they know that if we present them from the mimbar, Rasul Bhai Shamji Sukar se, I mean, a letter, you know, we'll have to receive this letter where he will say that you are, Bana, you are presenting these mentally disturbed views. You are trying to create a cult. You are trying to brainwash people. This is the accusations that you get when you do what? When you open the Quran and present verses, Al Islah, Alhamdulillah, we are so blessed that we have the facility. We open the Quran, we show you the clear verse. We open the book of Hadith, we show you clear Hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. We show you clear statements of Imams of Ahlul Bayt, as we've been doing in these lectures and all other lectures. And we also show you the statements and verdicts of your own maraja and scholars that you claim to follow. But because you don't like what the message that we are presenting. You try to attack us and character assassinate us and ridicule us, which is fine. We signed up for this. We don't. In fact, me, I used to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that, Ya Allah, I am ashamed and I feel guilty that, Ya Allah, your prophet and your imams, when they, uh, our imams, when they preached guidance, they got ridicule from their community. People cursed them. Amir al muminin Ali bin Abi Talib alayhi salam was cursed from the Umayyad pulpit for 90 years. Abu Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam, after the event of Karbala, you will read in the Maqtal of Arba'een that Ibn Ziyad la'anatullah alayhi came on the member and he said, Alhamdulillah alladhi na'udhu billah. He uttered these blasphemous words where he glorified Allah and said that Allah is the one who killed the Kathab, son of the Kathab, wal'iyadu billah. He referred to Imam al-Hussein as a liar. So when I used to read this, I used to feel so ashamed that, Ya Allah, these most beloved slaves of yours, when they used to give speeches, when they used to preach the haq, 
they used to be insulted they used to be called liars they used to be called madmen they used to be called magicians and soothsayers and ya allah us lowly sinful slaves when we sit on the mimbar and we recite people recite salawat nare haydari this that and when we come down they shower us with love and roses and garlands metaphorically speaking and they say mashallah mola salamat rakhe and may you live long and this and that i used to feel guilty and ashamed and i used to say ya allah i am so ashamed that i have never suffered any insult for your sake and this means that i have not done your work because if i start doing your work i should receive the same feedback that rasulullah and the imams used to receive this is what convinced me that i am on ba i'm not doing the job i'm supposed to be doing but now when i read feedback like this i say alhamdulillah all praise be to allah that at least obviously we can never even go near the ankles of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wa sallam but at least now we have more in common with rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wa sallam our beloved grandfather our messenger our role model our qudwa our uswa now we have more in common with him than we had previously before we came to al islah because before no one was condemning us no one was accusing us no one was bad mouthing us maybe because we were not preaching the full truth or maybe because we didn't know the full truth everyone has a journey everyone goes through a journey we learn things that we did not know allah tells his prophet wa allamaka ma lam takun ta'lam allah tells rasulullah i taught you things that you did not know so even rasulullah went through a journey we all go through this journey maybe inshallah we pray for you rasul bhai even you go through this journey where you see those clear evidences from the quran and the teachings of ahlul bayt which changed us which brought us to al islah which which made us what we are today may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open your eyes to that guidance and those evidences because if you don't see them here allah will certainly be using them against you in the hereafter because he said very clearly in the quran wa innahu la dhikrul laka wa liqaumika wa sawfa tusalun this quran is my reminder to you o prophet and to your people and you shall most certainly be questioned about what i revealed in this quran and if after reading the quran you look at what's going on in the community you are asking your hajat from imams across the curtain of ghaib when allah forbade you from doing this in the quran allah said ud'uni astajib lakum call upon me you have hajat amma yujibul mustarr idha da'ahu wa yakshifu as-su allah challenges who other than me responds to the call of the distressed when he is in distress and removes his distress other than me a ilahum ma allah is there a god together with allah who can do this and unfortunately in our community belief system they say yes there are other entities they are not gods but they have god like powers allah has empowered them to fulfill our hajat to relieve our distress when allah never taught you this in the quran and the imams of ahlul bayt never taught you this in their authentic teachings and allah warned you in the quran that at the time of death if you do dua to any entity you ask your hajat and your needs across the curtain of ghaib from any entity other than me the first question the angels will ask you at the time of death aina ma kuntum tad'una min dunillah where are those whom you used to supplicate to and make dua to other than allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so anyways i can go on and on about this we have been preaching a lot about this on al islah but this is just one thing that we found out that is wrong in our communities there is so much more that we found out when we sincerely and seriously studied the clear verses of the quran when we studied the clear teachings of ahlul bayt alayhim assalam when we studied the clear statements of the ulama and maraji' in the sources we realized so much of what is going around us is wrong and then we had a choice either we keep quiet and we just reform ourselves or we spread this in the community if we had kept quiet and not shared this with you in this dunya you would be very happy with us because this is the reality of this dunya people in this dunya don't like to be told the truth this is what prophets say after their nations are destroyed don't you see in surah al-araf how the prophets say that nasahtu lakum i gave you the best nasiha i gave you the best advice walakin la tuhibbun an-nasihin but the problem with you people is you don't like well wishers someone who comes and tells you the truth you don't like such people people who sell you lies and dreams and false narratives from the mimbar you love them you honor them you give them the highest respect but you do so at your own detriment on the day of judgment these dreams and fairy tales that they are sharing to you from the mimbar they will not help you and your own maraji we shared with you the advisories 
where Sayyid Sistani time and again has appealed that Baba, please don't sell religion short from the mimbar. Don't sell people dreams and 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 khurafat because that will bring bad reputation to the Husseini mimbar. The Husseini mimbar is supposed to be an intellectual platform where you connect people with the book of Allah and the Quran verified ahadith of Ahlul Bayt alayhi so this is what we are campaigning for. We are not calling for anything crazy or outrageous or insane in our communities. So khair, our beloved uncle says to us, you and your cult, as much as you try to brainwash the innocent believers, we are not brainwashing anyone. We are not forcing you to accept what we are saying. We are simply presenting to you the evidence, food for thought. You want to reflect on it and change your uh, ways well and good. If you don't want to listen to it, we are not forcing you to listen to us. Okay. We are no longer even asking you to give us the mimbar. Alhamdulillah, the Al-Islah community has provided the platform. Whoever wants to come and benefit, he's free to benefit. You don't want to benefit, you want to put earplugs. That is also your choice. We can't force guidance on anyone, can we? Even Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was not given that authority. So no, dearest uncle, we are not out to brainwash anyone. If you were out to brainwash anyone, we would be telling people, just listen to what I am saying, follow me, obey me blindly. This is brainwashing. We are presenting to you evidence from the kitab, from the sunnah, and from the statements and researches of the best scholars in the hawzat of Najaf and Qum, who support many of the positions that we have been advocating for and who have warned against many of the deviations that we have been campaigning against. So now you are going to also call those scholars in the Hawzat of Najaf and Qum. You are also going to accuse them of being mentally disturbed. What kind of approach is this? You are living in the 21st century. You should have more tolerance for difference of opinion. You need to understand the school of Ahlul Bayt is not monolithic. It is not a dictatorship that there is only one opinion. When you go into the Hawzat, you study the books. You will see there are so many different theories and opinions that scholars have and so many different outlooks. And ultimately, we should choose the outlook of the scholar who is, which is closest to the Quran and the Quran verified teaching of Ahlul Bayt. That is all that we are saying. So in any case, you are saying that you and your cult, as much as you try to brainwash the innocent believers, you will not be able to accept a few whose mindset are like yourself. It is not a surprise because Shaitan also took it to himself that he will only be able to deviate a few. Uh, this is where you're wrong, beloved uncle. Shaitan did not take upon himself to deviate only a few. I think you are saying this because your perception is that Al-Islah members are few and the mainstream traditional community is the majority. So because you see Al-Islah as being few in number, so that's why you have tried to craft your sentence and say that shaitan took it upon himself. Shaitan also took it to himself that he will only be able to deviate a few. This is wrong. In the Quran, shaitan doesn't say I have taken upon myself to deviate a few only. He says the actual words in the Quran are La ajma'in. I will deviate and I will mislead and misguide all of them, all human beings in their entirety. Except those of your slaves who are utterly devoted to you, Ya Allah. Those I will not be able to misguide. So Shaitan says, majority, I will take. The few utterly devoted people who are completely devoted to you, yes, those I will not be able to influence. So your statement, uh, beloved uncle, is uh, incorrect. It is Quranically inaccurate because you are saying, that shaitan said he would only deviate a few. No, go back to the Quran. Read Surah Bani Israel. He says very clearly to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, قَالَ أَرَأَيْتَكَ هَذَا الَّذِي كَرَّمْتَ عَلَيَّ لَإِنْ أَخَّرْتَنِي إِلَى يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ لَأَحْتَنِكَنَّ ذُرِّيَّتَهُ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا Shaitan says, Oh Allah, have you looked at this? Have you considered the case of this Adam whom you have elevated above me? I swear, if you grant me respite until the day of judgment. If you grant me respite until the day of judgment, I will destroy and misguide his entire progeny except for a few. So he didn't say I will misguide the few. He said I will misguide the majority and I will spare the few. So the fact that Al-Islah are few is not working in your favor. 
it is going against what you are trying to argue. You are trying to insinuate that the majority is uh, the majority are those whom shaitan will not be able to misguide. But the reality is that shaitan will target the majority, illa qalila, except a few who will be spared from the evil effects of his attacks. And then you write. So already we can see a disconnect between what you are writing and what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said in the Quran. In the end, you mention, you say, and knowing the nature of shaitan in the end would declare to his devotees that he would be free from them because he too fears the almighty Allah. Yes, this part is accurate. This is actually mentioned in the Quran that shaitan is going to do bara'ah. He's going to disassociate from all those who are devotees and followers of him. And he's going to say, he says, I fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then you ask us the question, does this mean that when the time to flee comes, you will also free yourself from your devotees like shaitan will do to his? So Aslan, I'm not out to assemble devotees or followers, my beloved uncle. You have mis misunderstood me if you think this is what I'm after. If I was after devotees, if I was after fan following, by the way, before I came to Al-Islah, I had the largest uh, and the, the, the most wide fan following and celebrity status in your community. Did I not? It is after coming to Islah that I lost all of that fan following and all that celebrity status that you people previously had given me. So if I was after fan following, if I, I was after accumulating and amassing devotees, why would I come to a place like Al-Islah, which is such a small platform, which has such small resources, which is just a bunch of uh, humble and sincere youths from our communities who do not have resources of the kind the Jamaats have. Why did I come to this small Nindo platform? When I had the largest platform, I have re recited Majalis from your member in Dar es Salaam, which is such a big platform. I have recited Majalis from the member of Toronto, which is a community that goes into the thousands. So I had the big platform. I had the big fan following. I had the celebrity status. That is what I gave up to come to Al-Islah. So think about this. That if I was a worldly person after goals of this dunya, I should have done the opposite. And if I'm a talib of dunya, I should leave and abandon Al-Islah. Because Al-Islah is a very small platform. How many views do they get? How many members do they have? Very small platform. If I abandon Al-Islah and I become a traditional promoter of ghulu and lies against the Ahlul Bayt, I swear to you, I can develop a very big following. But this big following is going to be a liability and a curse and la'na for me on the Day of Judgment. And yes, if I were to amass a following of devotees by preaching a message that goes against Allah's revelations in the Quran, against the sunnah of his beloved messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, against the real teachings of the Ahlul Bayt, then indeed what you have mentioned here would, be, would come true on me. But alhamdulillah, and with the tawfiq and grace of Allah, I can assure you, and with my hand on the Quran, that I am not out to preach anything that goes against the book of Allah and the sunnah of the messenger and the Quran verified teachings of the Ahlul Bayt. And if you can show me any aspect of my preaching that is going against the Quran or the sunnah or the Quran verified teachings of the Ahlul Bayt, -salam, which are the teachings that we regard as authentic, then I will immediately apologize. I will retract. I have changed so many of my positions in the past. There were things I used to believe yesterday that I don't believe today. Why did I change? Because I saw the evidence. Because I saw clear verses of Quran, which I had not pondered upon previously. But when I saw them, I understood their message. I did tawbah and I said, Ya Allah, I shift from my previous wrong view to the correct view that you have presented here. And the same thing with the sunnah, same thing with the ahadith of Ahlul Bayt. The more I studied the ahadith of Ahlul Bayt, the more I realized how much of what is popular in our communities is complete falsehood. It's something that Allah and the Rasul and the Imams of Ahlul Bayt disassociated from and issued severe warnings against. And it is these severe warnings that I am presenting to you through the platform of Al-Islah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless and reward all those who have made this platform possible and who have given us the opportunity and supported us in the opportunity of delivering this very important message to our communities, to our households. So, yes, if I was someone who was preaching batil, I would definitely come under the category of those who will flee and also free themselves of their devotees the way shaitan does that. But I'm not preaching the message of shaitan. I am warning against the tricks and deception of shaitan. 
I'm warning against the shirk, against the ghulu, against the bid'ah. And I hope I can, stall, I can stand tall on the day of judgment. I can show my face to my creator and tell him that, Ya Allah, whatever ni'mah and whatever blessings you blessed me, blessed me with, if you gave me talents, if you gave me skills, if you gave me public speaking ability, I used it to promote the truth of your book. I used it to promote the sunnah of your messenger. I used it to promote the teachings of the Ahlul Bayt Ali Musalam. But I'm curious what you will answer on the day of judgment when you are asked by Allah Azza wa Jal why you opposed and defied and ridiculed and laughed at those who were presenting to you the real teachings of the Quran and the Sunnah and the Ahlul Bayt of the Prophet. This is something you have to worry about. If you say, because you've written after that, that no, I'm not a religious scholar, I don't have insights then Allah has already given you clear instructions. Allah says, do not pursue that which you have no knowledge of. If you do not have knowledge, then don't speak without knowledge. If you have certain knowledge, if you have clear burhan and evidence from the Quran and the Sunnah and the Quran verified teachings of Ahlul Bayt Ali Musalam, then bring them forward. Hatu burhanakum, bring your proof. I have changed in the past. I am still prepared to change today. If you can give me Authentic proof. Aslan, I stand where I am today because the Dalil has made me stand here. The clear evidence of the Quran and the Sunnah and the teaching of the Ahlul Bayt has changed me and brought me here. If you show me some other teaching from them, which I can verify from the Quran, which I can verify through the tools Allah has blessed us with, then 100% I guarantee you I will be the first to change. Aslan, I changed in the first place because the evidence made me change. If you show me superior evidence, I will be happy to change again. This is my promise and my guarantee to you. We are sincere people here. We are not out to misguide. We fear Allah. We know we will be made to stand in front of him on the day of judgment. We have to give hisab for every single statement that we make and every single thing that we say. Allah has said there are two that are recording every single thing that you say. So whenever I speak, I have this in mind. I have to meet Allah on the day of judgment. I have to meet my creator. I have to give hisab. And I also want to be in a position where I can, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honors us with the opportunity to meet our beloved grandfather, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on the hawd and his beloved Ahlul Bayt. And we can say to them that Ya Rasulullah and Ya A'immatana, we tried to spread your true message. Even at a time when it, it had become so unpopular and people were so against it, that they were prepared to shower us with all sorts of insults and ridicule, but we tolerated all of that and we happily signed up for it just so that we could do justice to your mission and your message and just so that we could stand true to what you have asked us to preach. So then our beloved uncle addresses us and he says, please grow up. So this is our uncle being very um, patronizing and condescending and telling us to grow up because he knows the people at Al-Islah um, are young people and they have previously referred to us as Ninda Bacha, that we are very little children and we, you know, it makes us feel young. So we don't mind it. We don't get insulted by this, even though it's patronizing and condescending. Uh, but still, uh, please grow up, he writes. Uh, and yes, Aslan, uh, when you say grow up, what do you mean? We want, our, we want us to grow up and we want our communities to grow up as well. We are involved in a lot of immature, irrational, mindless rituals that we have inherited from our forefathers for which Allah revealed no sultan, no authorization, no sanction. So we, uh, you are telling us to mature? Yes. Pray for us that Allah gives us maturity and that we grow up and we also want our community to grow up together. And then you write, propagate as much as you like and want to. But speak about your good and bad qualities and don't use the shoulders of the Shia Isna Ashari to aim your target. We're not using anyone's shoulder. This is our community. We love it. We sincerely and genuinely desire khair for it. If you can't see that, may Allah make you see that. And if Allah has decided not to make you see that, then there is nothing we can do for you. And then you write, I am not a religious scholar. No, I have much insights to thorough understanding of the religious jurisprudence. Yes, but still Allah has given you Quran. And he has said, nas, This is guidance for all people. Non-Muslims are reading this Quran and coming to Islam. You are telling me that you have been born inside a house of Islam. You cannot see its clear verses, which are going against some of those things that we have warned against. 
we are inviting you to read the Quran, to read its clear verses, and to read the hadith of Ahlul Bayt, salam, which say the same thing which the verses of the Quran are saying. But khair, he writes, I am not a religious scholar, nor I have much insight uh, to thorough understanding of the religious jurisprudence, but, 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 to stand up against your understanding of religion, I will never shy away from it. So you are saying I have no insight, I am not a religious scholar, and I don't have thorough understanding, but I will still oppose your understanding, even though there is no my understanding. I am presenting clear verses of Quran, I am presenting a hadith of Ahlul Bayt, and I am also, don't forget, presenting understanding of your own marajah. Some of the statements which they make in Bahthul Kharij, which they have written in their books, but maybe the scholars are too afraid to share them in public because they fear that you will start attacking them the way you are attacking here. Maybe they have not presented it to you. So, okay, someone is now presenting it to you. Even if it's a nindo bacho, at least I am opening the books, I am showcasing the evidence, I am reading out the statements, and you can even get them checked by your own scholars. You can, you, I'm not asking you to blindly trust what we are saying. Take what we are presenting to your scholars, present it to them also. So you are saying that you have no religious knowledge, you I mean you are not you don't have thorough understanding of religious jurisprudence, you're not a religious scholar, but you will still stand up against my understanding. Well, there is no my understanding. I'm presenting to you evidence. And if you don't have knowledge of that evidence, then just remain silent. Allah says, La taqfu ma ilm. Don't pursue that which you have no knowledge of. In Your hearing, your sight, and your heart and your feelings. For all of these, Allah says, Kul, You will be questioned about everything. So if you are simply attacking us and criticizing and condemning us without knowledge, if you do it with knowledge, we welcome it. We would embrace in this entire write-up, I don't see even a single verse of Quran. I don't see a single hadith. I don't see anything. You're just criticizing and condemning, which we also give you the right to do. But how do you expect us to change if you don't offer us any evidence? We expect you to change because we are offering you evidence. We are offering you the statements of your creator, the statements of your prophet, the statements of your imams. <clears throat> What excuse do you have for not accepting that evidence? You say, no, 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 no. But until our marajah tell us, well, we have also presented to you now the statements of the marajah. And we've also presented to you, go and watch my lecture entitled, Why are the marajah silent? Because there are many deviations in our community, which the marja'iyah has not dared to openly condemn and criticize, even though in their advanced bahthul kharij, Behind closed doors, they say, yeah, this is wrong, ne arong che, ne arong che. But in public, they do not advertise and announce it too much. Why? I have answered this question uh, in that lecture. Why are the marajah silent? From the words of a grand marja himself, Ayatollah Sayyid Shaheed Muhammad Baqar al-Sadr, who cites the mindset that you represent as the reason why they don't present a lot of the things which they know to be wrong. They don't challenge it. Because of mindset like this, they are afraid that people, there will be backlash like this. So you say that you have no, you don't, you're not a religious scholar. You don't have that many insights to thorough understanding, but you will still stand up against our understanding. And you are entitled to do, to do that. We are not asking you to blindly follow us. We are not forcing our opinions on you. Feel free to stand up against us. Feel free to criticize. But at least do so with evidence. Bring us Burhan. Bring us Sultan from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. From the Quran. From the Sunnah. From the Quran verified authentic teachings of Ahlul Bayt alayhi wa Wallahi if you bring us proof from there. You can easily change us. Because ultimately where I am standing and sitting today. You know what brought me here is evidence from my Ahlul Bayt. From my Quran. From my creator. When I read what they have actually written. And I started relying on what's in the books instead of what you hear, hear say from here and there. <clears throat> when I read what's in the books, this is what brought me where I am today. I guarantee you, if you read what I have read, you will also end up here. Now you say, how will I get to read? I'm not a PhD in Arabic language and Islamic studies and all these subjects. I don't have knowledge. I don't have all of that. 
Fine, read the Quran yourself, read the translation, read Nahjul Balagha, read Sahifa Zajjadiya. It's not like Allah has left you completely clueless. He has given you resources. And if you are too lazy to do all, all that reading, then fine, we are giving you Al-Islah lectures in which we are giving you cooked, ready-made cooked material. We are opening the books ourselves. We are displaying the evidence. Imam Ali Alayhislam Aki Doche. Ne Imam Baqir Alayhislam Aki Dache. Ne Imam Sadiq Alayhislam Ni Ata Alim Che. Me Badu, we are presenting evidence. We are opening the books. We are showing you even the ahadith we present. We show you that Ayatollah Sistani's classmate, Ayatollah Muhsini, has authenticated this. This hadith, Ayatollah Sistani, has authenticated. This hadith, Al Allama Muhammad Baqir al Bahbudi, has authenticated. We are also sharing with you authentication. So that you don't say, I mean, a kabarnati a riwayat uh, present karache a, a zaif che, ke sahi che, bai, I mean, we are presenting to you what the Maharaj have said about the riwayat. What more do you want? But no, you don't want to engage. You want to, as Nuh alayhi salam complains in Surah Nuh, wa inni kullama da'autuhum, li taghfira lahum, ja'alu asabi'ahum fi adhanihim, wa staghshaw thiyabahum, wa asarru, wa stakbaru stikbaru. Nuh alayhi salam complained about his people. He said, Ya Allah, every time I invite them to, to the truth so that you should forgive them, what do they do? They plug their fingers into their ears. We don't want to listen. Nati sambarwanu ame. Whatever neaba bab dada neabada jakartahata, just close our eyes and continue in that direction. Mimbar we will only give to the Zakir who comes and tells us Badu right she netame ahle jannat cho and Bas, this is what we want. Give us the feel-good religion from the member or get out and go to some other platform. This is the message you have given loud and clear. And this is why your Zakirin and your scholars are afraid to preach the truth to you. And this is why platforms like Al-Islah are necessary. So that at least those scholars who have a conscience, who fear Allah, who know they have to stand in front of Allah, and who know that they will face humiliation on the day of ju judgment if they hide the truth and conceal the crucial warnings and evidence from the people. At least those scholars should have a platform ne, where they can come and sit and preach their conscience, preach what's actually in the Quran and what's actually in the books rather than feel good religion that is based on fairy tales and dreams and visions for which no verification exists in the book of Allah and the teachings of the Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam. Khair, at the end, he says, I have attached two clips with this broadcast. Which one is you and which one is Shaitan's comrade? So I tried to open the link that he has shared and it is a link where he has presented a video 2014 praying for the arrival of Imam Mahdi. Ajal Allahu Ta'ala Farajahu Sharif 2021. There is no proof for Imam being alive. Save your faith. Be, of, be aware of Islam group deception. Again, this is propaganda. Um, you are saying in 2021, we claim there is no proof for the Imam being alive. We never claimed that. There was a clip that was cut. It was circulated in that clip. We were discussing and presenting the evidence of those who reject from and not even Shia. We were presenting the uh, we were discussing the evidence of scholars of Ahlus Sunnah wal Jama'ah. It was a lecture. They cut a clip from it in which we were discussing because obviously when we come to discussion, we discuss the views of all scholars, right? Ibadi, what they have said, Zaidi, what they have said, Ismaili, what they have said, and Ahlus Sunnah, what they have said. So a lecture in which I'm discussing the views of Ahlus Sunnah scholars who reject belief in Imam al Mahdi. Because Ahlul Sunnah also have belief that a Mahdi is going to come. But some of their scholars have rejected this. They say no Mahdi is going to come. On what grounds? So I'm presenting their evidence so that we can discuss it. They cut that clip. They circulate it and say, oh, he's saying there is no proof that Imam Mahdi is alive. This is the level of your propaganda. And I mentioned, I even gave a lecture after, after that in which I told you what, that there are actually, because sometimes people don't know. I think at that time they do not know that there are Sunni scholars who reject Imam Mahdi. And who don't believe in his existence and don't believe that he will come. So I gave that lecture in which I showed you. And, and, and if they had listened to that clip with critical mind, the problem is our Tumiya Akili. They, they don't want to Tumiya Akili. In that lecture, I recall clearly that I had mentioned one of the proofs that the scholars of Ahlul Sunnah give, those who reject the concept of the Mahdi, they say it is not mentioned in Bukhari and Muslim. Now you tell me a Shia follower of the school of Ahlul Bayt, do you think he would reject something just because it is not mentioned in Bukhari and Muslim? Since when are Bukhari and Muslim hujjah on us? <laughs> that we should reject something simply because it is not mentioned in Bukhari and Muslim. No, no, no. If we are going to reject something, it is going to be for much stronger proof than that. 
right? It's not going to be for whimsical and, and weak proofs like the proofs that these Sunni scholars give, which is that, oh, something is not mentioned in Bukhari and Muslim, so it is false. Ya akhi, hadith of Ghadir is not mentioned in Bukhari, so what? Now we reject it, even though it is super mutawatir hadith narrated across the board by so many of the companions, Sahaba and Tabi'een. Just because Bukhari did not narrate it, we reject it. Like, what kind of methodology is that? That is not our methodology. So if they knew enough about us, they would never trust that, that uh, cut clip. But unfortunately, because we are doing reform, because we are calling towards Islah, they are ready to believe in the worst things about us. So khair, as far as the question of the Mahdi is concerned and the belief in the Mahdi, we mentioned that this is something, even the Al-Islah video, that was broadcast of Ayatollah Sayyid Kamal al-Haydari. He clearly mentioned in that video that yes, you cannot prove the birth of the Mahdi by the chain only methodology, the, the manhaj of Ayatollah Sayyid Abu Qasim al khui And he opened the books and he showed that yes, through the methodology and manhaj of Sayyid al khui which is the chain based method, you cannot uh, get enough authentic narrations about his birth to establish that the birth actually happened. So that's why but he did not say that there is no proof. The proof is there. It's just that it is you don't have enough proof that me meets the threshold to prove it only from an exclusively Sanadi point of view. But khair, that's just one aspect. There is other aspects as well. And Ayatollah Sayyid Kamal al-Haydari had promised that he will discuss other proofs as well. So to say that in 2021 or whichever year we have said there is no proof for Imam Mahdi being alive, this is a false statement against us. What we have actually said is that this is a topic that we are not going to give sound bites on. So that clip was not circulated by us. Uh, that was simply a clip that was cut from a lecture. Uh, as far as we are concerned, we are not going to give sound bites about a topic like this because when, uh, this is claimed to be aqidah. So when we go into discussions on aqidah, it is not just that I come out in one minute and I say, I believe in this or I don't believe in this. My belief, what I believe and I don't believe is not hujjah on anyone because there is no taqlid in aqidah. Rather, for such issues, what we do is we discuss the views of different scholars. Unfortunately, the vast majority of the public doesn't know that within the 12-hour imami school, there are different theories, different perspectives. Even someone like Al-Allama Tabatabai, Sahib Tafsir Al-Mizan, he's of the view, for example, that Imam Al-Mahdi will not come in this world, in this alam, in this realm, his zuhur will not take place in this realm. Rather, it's in a different realm. So this is a... I know Awamun Nas, the majority of the people, when they hear this view, they'll be taken aback. But yeah, Allama Taba Tabai, Sahib Tafsir Al-Mizan, 20 volumes of Al-Mizan and so many other books. And this is his view. Now you people will... If you were to hear Allama Taba Tabai saying this, you would start saying mentally disturbed and this and that. And Baba, he's a, he's, he had his tahqiq, he had his research. We don't agree with his research. No problem. But it's no reason to, to badmouth him and to condemn him and to character assassinate him. So he has his theory. Sheikh Haider Hubbullah has his theories. Uh, Al-Allama Sayyid Ali Abu Hassan has put forward his theories. There are so many different theories. Inshallah on Al-Islah, <clears throat> when we get to this topic, we will discuss all the different proofs, evidence, arguments. And we are not going to impose any view on anyone and say that this is what you have to, laziman, you have to believe. No, our job is to simply discuss the different arguments, proofs, evidence, theories. This is the view of this scholar. This is the view of this scholar. Whatever convinces you, because in, in Aqidah, you cannot hide behind any scholar. You have to go by the evidence. Whichever evidence convinces you, that is what is your hujjah between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So anyway, this, this is all, unfortunately, they keep on peddling and repeating and recycling the same propaganda which we have already debunked before. And then he ends by saying, dear community members with understanding, please don't get trapped into his whispering on YouTube because shaitan uses the same strategies. I'm not whispering, I'm speaking loud and clear. And I'm sharing with you what the Imams have said, what the Quran has said, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has expected of us. This is not whispering of shaitan. You are insulting the Quran and the teachings of Ahlul Bayt and the statements of your own scholars by calling what we present on Al-Islah whisperings of shaitan because we are only presenting this. We are not presenting anything from our pocket and we back up everything that we say with robust and authentic evidence. And then you conclude with my two cents, salams and du'as and we also respond to you with salam. 
And we make a dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Despite all these things that you have written, even though I think you deliberately and purposely tried to be hurtful and to ridicule and all of that, our beloved uncle, we forgive you for all of that. We do not take any of this personally because we know that you're only doing this and saying this because you've not seen what we have seen. <clears throat> Maybe if you were to see the evidences that we have seen, you would also be speaking like us or at least writing like us and warning your community and your your beloved ones the way we are warning our community and our beloved ones. And you would also be inviting people to return back to the actual deen of the Ahlul Bayt rather than the feel-good, fairy tale based Qurafat-based, fabrications-based deen that is unfortunately being sold in so many places. And then he concludes by signing off Rasul Shamji in personal capacity, 6th Muharram, 1446, 13th July, 2024. And I will also sign off by uh, once again reminding you that all of that, all of what I have presented to you and all of that I have said to you is out of a sincere, well-wishing, loving desire for khair for you. And I only desire khair for you. And I hope Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens the minds of our community members to these crucial evidences and texts that we are presenting from Al-Islah, from our Imams of Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam And at the end of it all, after presenting all of this, if you still decide to ignore and neglect and uh, throw away all of this evidence and proof from the Quran, from the Ahlul Bayt, and you decide to blindly follow what is going on around you, and what your leaders and what your scholars are preaching to you, which goes against the Quran and what the correct evidence that we have presented, then in that case, the only thing that I can say to you is what Mu'min Al Fir'aun said to his people after giving them the best nasiha he possibly could, after explaining to them how they had gone wrong. At the very end of it all, he said, Fasatadkuruna ma aqulu lakum. وَأُفَوِّضُ أَمْرِي إِلَى اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ بَصِيرٌ بِالْعِبَادِ This is verse 44 of Surah Ghafir, Surah number 44. He says, فَسَتَذْكُرُونَ مَا أَقُولُ لَكُمْ بَاسِمْ تَيَكُمْبُكَ نِنَايَوْ كُوَمْبِيَنِّي وَأُفَوِّضُ أَمْرِي إِلَى اللَّهِ نَمِمِي نَمْكَبِزِ مُنْيَزِ مُنْغُ مَنْبُ يَنْغُ Inna Allah basirun bil ibad. Hakika mwenyezi mungu anawaona wajawake. You will remember what I have said to you on the day of judgment when you are confronted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with all these evidences from his book and from his beloved slaves that we were presenting you with and with which we were warning you and asking you to return back to the original deen. You will remember these statements of ours on the day of judgment. وَأُفَوِّضُ أَمْرِي إِلَى اللَّهِ I surrender all my affairs to Allah. إِنَّ اللَّهَ بَصِيرٌ بِالْعِبَادِ Indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ever watchful and vigilant over what his slaves do and what they say. وَآخِرُ دَعْوَانَا أَنِ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ وَالسَّلَامُ عَلَيْكُمْ وَرَحْمَةُ اللَّهِ وَبَرَكَاتُهُ